Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode two of the People That Might Be Interesting podcast. And it's all in the name. Here's what we do. We go out and we find people we want to talk to because we think they might be, well, interesting. And in this case, today's episode, episode number two, I have Dennis E. Taylor. Now, the thing that makes Dennis really interesting is that he's an author. But he didn't start out that way. And I'll let him go into it, but it's not his first career. And he basically um, looked out at the world and said, I can do better. Now, can you imagine a world where those people aren't the most interesting ones around? I mean, those are the people that I want to talk to on this podcast, the people that say, I see what's going on out there and I can improve it, I can make it better, or I've come up with my own thing. And that's what Dennis has done. He's the author of one of my favorite series of books. His new one is called Heaven's River, but his books are called The Babaverse. The first one is called We Are Legion. Uh, the second one was For We Are Many. And then the, the third one that I thought was the last one, and fortunately he wrote another, was called um, All These Worlds. And it's a book about a, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna let him go into it more, but it's basically a book about a space probe, a replicating space probe with a personality. There's like a person inside there. And I know that's hard to... Hard to kind of wrap your brain around in a sentence or two, but it's a great series of books, and they're really well written, and he really understands people and the world and his character in particular. And I really enjoyed it. And then in addition to everything else, Dennis was just a great interview. He was a really cool person to talk to, and I think you're going to like him. This is a good one. I keep saying that. I'm very happy with my first, and now I'm very happy with my second. So here we go. Dennis E. Taylor. All right, Dennis E. Taylor is with me today, and I couldn't be more excited. Dennis, first of all, let me be probably the 10,000th person to say congratulations. You were number one on the Audible bestseller list. That is just incredible. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am actually, I am occasionally number one on the Audible bestsellers list. Every time Audible puts out a daily deal, I get bumped. And then as soon as the daily deals off, I'm back in number one. So it's it's like a roller coaster. Wow, that's incredible. But no, yeah. congratulations. I finished the new book. I was really trying to finish it. I finished it yesterday. As much as I would love to ask you all kinds of technical questions about it, I, I'm going to, obviously, I don't want to spoil anything, um, but I, I really did enjoy it. But the question I kind of want to go into first, um, so how do you... I, I tried to explain the Baba verse to my wife and I kind of trailed off as she was giving me this face of what the hell are you talking about? If I know you, that face. If you had an elevator pitch for the Baba verse, what would it be? Uh, let's see. Computer programmer resuscitated as a, an artificial intelligence pilots a spaceship to the stars. Ah, well, that, you did way, way better than I did because I got the crazy face. <laughs> My wife does that crazy face. <laughs> so you're on the I, fo- Sorry, go ahead. W- without even having met your wife, I know exactly what she looked like. <laughs> yeah, no, that was it. So, you, But you're on the fourth book already. I mean, have, yeah. you, have you been, I mean, I don't, I don't know how, I've never written a book, so I presume you put it out there in the world and you're kind of like, Gee, I hope this, I hope people like this. Every single time. Uh, it, it is really stressful. And actually, Ray was, was uh, stressed out about it, too. He, he posted something on the fa- Facebook group to the effect of, man, I'm really, t- I'm really nervous, like the day before of the release. So, yeah, the, the stage fright thing, it never goes away. You're always thinking, oh, my God, is this the book that I'm going to write that's just going to suck? Well, let me let me start from the beginning because I'm already jumping way down my list of my list of questions here. So, you have to me because I I always I'm a look behind the curtain p- kind of person. So it's yes, I'll like a book, but then I've got to find out who the author is. And if I like the book, I'll go look up the author and see what else have they written and kind of read their biography and find out more about them. And um, when I read your kind of the the little blurb at the the end of the book or whatever it was. It was very interesting because this is really your second career. 
Well, it's probably more it's probably more like my third career oh, if, wow. if you really wanted to count it. Um, I started out well, maybe my fourth career. Oh my god! Um, my first full time job was with McDonald's. Uh, my second full time job was as a loans officer. Uh, my third full time job was uh, computer programming, and that lasted most of my life. And then this. So yeah, I've been around. So at what point did it seem reasonable to you having a, a full time job and career and being a professional in you know as a computer engineer, a software engineer, to go? I am now going to go write science fiction. And did you also get the crazy face for that decision? No, actually, it was my wife that uh, dared me to do it. Um, I've, I've told this story before, but I, I think it bears repeating. I um, I had recently gotten the Kindle app on my Galaxy notebook. Not notebook. Um, Tablet. What did they What did they call their pad, their iPad version? You know, they're called. Um, actually, they're called Galaxies because I was just okay. looking at the six or the seven. So yeah, it's the oh, Galaxy anyway, my, tablet. Yeah, my first tablet was a Galaxy, and I got the Kindle app on it, and I right away went off and downloaded a bunch of free, um, free novels, and one of them, and I will not give the name, um, was so bad just so bad about 30 pages in I, I figuratively threw the tablet against the wall and said oh my god I can't believe they got this published I could write better than this and my wife said well do it give it a try and I kind of stared at her for a few seconds and thought about it and I've, I've always sort of had this thing in the back of my mind where I had a few ideas so I grabbed my laptop fired up word and you know dinked around with it for a few minutes and finally started writing outland it was never intended to be a career it was um, just something to do to see if i could do it well and interestingly you're not you don't have a you're self published now you're with audible but your books are self am i saying that right you're self published I guess I, I think I'm a hybrid um, because I'm self-published for text versions and uh, Audible is effectively my publisher for, for the audio version. So with your level of success on Audible, have the publishers come calling? I did get an offer for, uh, well, my agent uh, negotiated with Tor and we did get an offer for Singularity Trap, but it was... Yeah. And, you know, at that time, I still didn't have that big of a reputation. I, I guess Tor was probably at that point saying, well, he does seem to have, you know, put out a couple of successful books anyway. But, you know, I still wasn't really on their radar. So the 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 offer was and Ethan and I talked about it and just said, no, we'll just we'll just continue with what we're doing for the moment. since I'm, I'm totally throwing off my script here, um, <laughs> one of the things that I've, I've found very interesting about this, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to invite you on, is that, especially with technology, technology has become this great leveler in some ways. Um, and, and, and there's good and bad. But you know, the example that I always use is for under $1,000, you can now build a music recording studio in your bedroom, in your garage, in your basement, that would rival the ability of a music studio that would cost a million dollars 15, 20 years ago. Now, of course, there's no talent there necessarily, but you can build the studio. So if you can do it, you can now produce it and put it out on YouTube. You can become your own record label, and lots of people do that. I've tried to look mm -hmm. for that analog in Hollywood, and it doesn't really exist yet, but YouTube kind of fits that niche where... <laughs> You know, you have people that are getting millions of views. Hollywood be jealous. Hollywood would be jealous of how many views some of these YouTubers are getting for their original content. And it seems like it seems like there's a direct to consumer model now. Every car you get, you can get a you know a hundred options on. You know, everything you order can be customized directly for you. And as somebody who's you know been around enough to remember when 
publishers were the gatekeepers and record labels were the great gatekeepers. How does it feel to be able to almost skip at least most of that and go directly to the consumer? Well, it's definitely a sea change. Uh, it's so different from when I was growing up and when I was young. Um, of course, we had dinosaurs back then. Um, but, yeah, you're right. It's it's now a situation where anybody can self-publish a book, and you can do it for literally no money at all if you want to do everything yourself. If you do your own cover, you do your own editing, you know, you do your own um, – work up with, with uh, Kindle and stuff like that. You can publish a novel for literally zero dollars and zero cents. The problem is that you use the word gatekeeper with publishers, and that is uh, an excellent word to use because agents and gatekeepers were one of the, or, sorry, agents and publishers were the gatekeepers that kept the quality of novels up. When you had a, a limited amount of shelf space in your uh, chapter's bookstore, you wanted quality books that people would buy. Now it's just an, uh, a web page, takes up no space. And I think the last time I heard, Amazon has like 5 million uh, novels listed on their site. And most of them are, of course, self published. And I have a feeling that. The quality, based on that one that I mentioned before, is probably down a little bit. Yeah, I, says, I, I will admit I have a hard time finding things to read sometimes, and I've, I've become much more dependent on authors. All right, I know this person puts out good quality. Um, things like that, or, you know, or are they published? Is this the kind of thing? But, um, yeah, I, I, will, I agree with you on that. Yeah, I've, I've always gone with authors. Um, actually, strangely, I've always gone with authors for, for reading material, but I've never really gone with artists for um, songs. I always just looked for the individual song. So I never really bought much in the way of albums. I mostly bought singles. Ah, and okay. that's going the other way. Yeah. You know? Um, a lot of it has to do with, I think, how much time you have to put into things. Um, when, you're, when you're young and poor, uh, you have lots of time, but not much money. So you're willing to put in a lot of time to make sure that your limited funds are spent properly. When you get older and you hopefully have more money, uh, you definitely have less time, uh, you become a little more willing to spend a little money to make sure that you you uh, don't waste your time. And, and I think that difference in attitude, um, not sure exactly where I'm going with this actually, but I, I, at least for me, that has shaped how I shop online, especially at Amazon and stuff. Well, consumer... You know, it's, it's one of those big things. If you've ever been, like I, I used to, in a previous life, sort of have to go to like shopping center conventions where they were always trying to get in their consumer's brain. Who is yeah. our consumer? Why are they buying our stuff? What do they like or what do they not like about our stuff? And then they would sit down and they would try to dissect every little market that they have. And it was, it was very intriguing for me, not so much the individual details because that kind of came and went, but just the idea of here are these people who spend their entire lives just trying to get in people's heads. And there's a, there's a statement that I use, and I try to teach my kids this, and I, I, I use it all the time. And it's when the service is free, you are the product. Yeah. So Facebook is free because they are selling me to advertisers. Yep. And as I just try to keep telling my kids that. If, if, if it's free, it's somebody's paying for it and you should at least acknowledge who that who who is paying for you at that moment at least yep so let me change gears on you okay well a little bit who is your favorite science fiction author or who what are the authors that you really look forward to reading um well unfortunately um some of the authors that i really like to read are dead like robert hyman and isaac asimov 
Um, some of the authors that I like to read are no longer producing much, like Larry Niven. Yeah. Um, he does he does uh, collaborations with people nowadays, but uh, you know that 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 can lend a little more unevenness un- unevenness to things. Um, I have always there, there are certain authors whose books I will buy without even bothering to read the the back cover. Uh, Jack McDevitt, okay, for instance. Um, <laughs> trying to trying to think of, of um, somebody else, but it, I, ow, it'll it'll come. Scalzi and you actually are those are the two that I have right now that I'll just pre order the second I see something hit Audible. Yeah, I've I've only read a couple of John Scalzi's things, um, but uh, I, I really liked it. And there's, uh, I think we have very similar styles and, and senses of humor, which helps a lot when you're, um, you know, when you're deciding whether or not you like something. Well, and honest to God, this is a next question coming up. I swear, um, your prose style is very similar to what I what I refer to kind of as Heinlein and Scalzi in that there's uh, there's a lot of discussion, but it's very witty and forward thinking and forward moving. It's, I mean, as much as I like Herbert and I like Tolkien, um, the expository can get a little thick and it, it's not a kind of a quick moving text. Uh, and so I, I really think that you've done a great job with that. But as you think about how you developed your prose style, did you think, I mean, did you go back to say a Heinlein and say, if I were to emulate somebody, that is what it, it would be? Or did it just come naturally? Uh, I don't, I didn't consciously go look at any authors and um, with, with one small exception that I'll get into, but I, I didn't consciously go to any authors and look at their style and say, I have to write this way. But I think that um, I picked up my writing style from 50 years plus of reading science fiction. And most of that reading was people like Heinlein. So I picked up their style of writing. Uh, there's really no other way to explain it. I mean, I, I went from, from zero to 60 in very little time and I didn't take any courses. I did some internet research. So it, it has to have been absorbed and internalized just from my reading. All right. So something that Heinlein at least was famous for, and other authors do this too, but I I think of it mostly with him is he's got a character in pretty much almost all of his novels that really represent him. Like in stranger in a strange land, it was Jubal Hershaw. So are you Bob? Some parts of me are Bob. Um, certainly Bob's attitude towards things, definitely. Um, I am an engineering mindset type of person. Uh, if I met Bob, I would be good friends with him, certainly. Um, there, there is a little bit of, um, I don't know what you want, if you want to call it wish fulfillment in, in, we are legion because uh, you know I, I I basically wrote a story that was a story I'd like to read, so you know certainly it, it resonates with me. So in, in like we are legion, um, so the algorithm said to me, "Hey, we think you might like this," and I read the little you know the blurb or whatever and said, "You know I had a credit because I'm a subscriber," and I'm like, "Okay, I think I might like that too," and it was a you know, I, I really did enjoy it, obviously, and I've, I've listened to them all now and read them a couple of times. And it, it seems like there's there's a juxtaposition in the, the book in that you have somebody who is in solitude, but at the same time, it's very much, I would say especially in this last book, but in, in all of them, I think, also very much about how... I, I guess there's there's a big relationship component. So it's about solitude and fighting solitude and being okay with solitude and then trying to push away from it in a way that's kind of meaningful. I, I, my question's kind of meandering here, 
but it just seems like there's this bounce back and forth between um, kind of this rugged individualism and then this sense of community. Is, is any of that making sense with you? Yes, it, it does. Um, people come in two types. Those who, who divide people into two types and those who don't, that's the standard joke. Uh, <laughs> but we get past that. People come in two types. Those who are, um, I guess what you'd call social butterflies. So those who are very sociable and very easy with social situations and those who are not. And those of us who are not, um, we tend to become programmers and engineers and such. And, uh, I can, I can gear myself up for a social situation. If I knew in advance, you know, I'm going to a cocktail party or, or whatever it is, I can, I can psych myself up, but I have to psych myself up. And after a while it gets really tiring and I have to go hide in the bathroom or something just to, just to get my energy back. My wife can go to one of those things and just circulate all night. And, and at the end of the night, she's as, as fresh as when she started. And it, we all know people like that. We all know people on both sides of that. For those of us who are not naturally um, social butterflies, there there is a pull in both directions. On the one hand, we want friends. You know, we, we want social interaction. We, we don't want to be, you know, isolated. But on the other hand, we also don't want too much of it. So there's this back and forth thing like I'm going to go off for six hours and, and you know program a computer or something but then I'd like a couple of hours of social interaction and then maybe I'll go back to my computer and that's what Bob goes through Bob is essentially a loner uh, he likes interaction he likes having friends but he also likes his uh, his alone time the great thing about the way things work out for him is that if you're interacting with another you, is that social time or alone time? Mm, yeah. Well, and it's interesting. I think, I don't know about page for page, but it seems like Bob gets a little more time in this latest book, Heaven's River. Um, it seems like Bob is a little, Bob's always been a character, certainly in the first book, but then in the second and third book, you know, he kind of takes, not second stage, but he, there are definitely other characters that step up. Was that a conscious effort to make Bob more of the main character again? Yeah, that, that was a that was a deliberate decision. I wanted a more single track book this time around. Um, books one, two, and three were were multiple interlocking stories uh, with multiple interlocking timelines, and it was it was a lot of fun to write. And it, you know, it made for made made for some great stories. But this time around, I wanted to just try a single track main story uh, taking place in a short period of time, and you know, some some interweaving stories because I think that makes a book a little more interesting. But mostly, yeah, it was about Bob. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, um, and I really, it's it isn't so just to again, I don't want to. I'm not giving anything away, but just to kind of set the tone for the universe. So Bob, like you said, was an engineer. He gets, I mean, I think literally hit by a bus. He wakes up as a space probe, a self-replicating space probe. And through and there's lots of machinations for how that happens in drama, of course. But as a self-replicating, you know, space probe, he then replicates himself, kind of in the name. And as such, all of these new Bobs appear and they take on their own individual personalities and, the, and you start to get what you refer to as drift, but they, they start to take on in, the individual characteristics of the people that they are. They're not just new Bob. They're an entirely new character. And it's how much time do you spend sitting down trying to say, these are the traits of this one and these are the traits of this one? Um. I don't really spend a lot of time at it. Uh, they tended to evolve. Uh, there were a couple of, of Bobs in, in the first book that needed specific traits. Um, Homer needed specific traits. Riker, um, Mario, people like that. For the most part, the rest of them, uh, Bill, Garfield, and, uh, and so forth, they just evolved. 
I needed my, you know, as I wrote the characters, they tended to react in certain ways. And I would say, oh, that sounds like a reasonable personality trait. And I'll just go with that. I, I don't know if you noticed, but in Heaven's River, Garfield is a bit of a curmudgeon. He's always complaining about something. Mm-hmm. And uh, I that just things just went that way. Yeah, I did notice that. And I, I liked getting a little bit more Garfield. I'll admit I'm a uh, Riker fan. Um, so I was glad to see him in it. And I, his evolution over time has been interesting, especially obviously with everything that happened with Homer and the earlier books and whatnot. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed his evolution. Yeah. Riker now doesn't have as distinct a personality maybe as he did at first because he really was humorless and duty driven uh, in the first book, but that kind of got beat out of him and he's much more philosophical now. And I think he's almost bill like in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I, I kind of think of him as the adult as he's the mm. most adult. He's the most daddish of the yeah. bobs. And uh, I kind of appreciated that and that that seems to be what he brings to the conversation, this kind of adult manner of stepping back and saying, okay, we're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Right. So I, I yeah, kind of, I think that's a reasonable uh, appraisal. So one of the things with the Baba verse, um, and, and that's the phrase that's give, that's used for, the universe that this takes place in. It's called the Baba verse because everything there's like Bob tube and there's kind of this running gag because they're all from Bob. So everything, lots of things have kind of a, a Bob in the title just for fun. Yeah. And, um, but I'm always impressed with how many, how the logical steps occur in the universe. It, it always seems like there's the first logical step and then that immediately bring up the next logical step. And the, and I want to ask you about that, but the example that I always heard was, have you ever seen the show South Park? Yeah. And the creators of South Park said, when you're working on a story, you're not going to do this happens and then this happens. That's not a story. What they say is, first, this happens, therefore, this happens. They say there has to be an internal logic to what happens, otherwise you have, you know, family guy. And yep. so they, they really beat that home. There's a great YouTube clip of them explaining it. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about all of the books is how the logical reasoning carries through. And you can almost follow one logical thread from conclusion to conclusion to conclusion through the entire book. Mm-hmm. So do you spend a lot of time, I mean, do you just sit down and write or do you have the entire thing kind of figured out before you sit down and write? I have a general outline when I sit down and begin to write. Um, I have an idea. I know where the book's going and I have an idea how I'm going to get there, but a lot of the details aren't there yet. Uh, my first write, my, my first pass through the alpha write is uh, just stream of consciousness. I just, I just write. And I, some of the chapters I write, like I'm writing roadkill right now. And uh, I know that some of this stuff just isn't going to make it into the final book because it, it's it's either not exciting or it's illogical or something. But I have to write it in order to get to a milestone that I do want to have there. And then when I'm finished, I look at it and I say, okay, this section in here, this doesn't work. i got to figure out a way to get them from A to B. Um, but the, the first pass is is always just get it on paper, get something on paper, get a, get a structure going. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm always kind of amazed again, I'm behind the curtain. I always, I always try to figure out how books are written and it seems like there's so much interweaving or at least in the first three books, there was so much going on and coming together at one time. Was that hard to keep track of? Uh, well, it could have been, but I, I, uh, I'm a, computer programmer so I wrote some software to keep track of things uh, and I also used Excel um, for the basic timeline and uh, yeah the, I mean I had to move stuff around uh, some dates changed some of the order in which things happened changed but uh, it came together all right let me change books on you for a second if you don't mind sure. um, singularity trap I really enjoyed that um, 
it was a darker tone where at it, at its core the 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 bob books the bobiverse books are optimistic it it says the future can be great and you know it's up to us to make it great and yeah there are challenges obviously cuz books aren't good without challenges but it's an optimistic series and mm-hmm. the singularity trap i'm not saying it was dour but i i mean i re- recently li- re-listened to it kind of in waiting for the Heaven's River to come out um, because I I listened to it on my commute. And I just, from the start, you have somebody who, who, their life kind of sucks. I mean, they're they're in a bad spot and it never really changes throughout the book. And, you know, obviously I won't give anything away, but it, it was, it was a more pessimist or I don't know, would you say it was more pessimistic or did it come from a different place? Um, I think more than anything else, it came from a different place. Uh, We're back to the South Park logic again, though. Um, If you start with the idea that you've got a bunch of people doing asteroid mining, that inevitably defines the time period that they're operating in. They can't be in the 1950s. Uh, So, you know, late 21st century... um, early 22nd century kind of thing. If you've got people in that time period, logically, either they've figured out global warming or they haven't. And I went with haven't and, and so on. If you you go, if you go through a series of steps and say, well, what would be the case for this? What would be the case for that? What's the politics like, you know, what's the environment like, Um, what, what is the economy like? And, uh, it, I didn't have a lot of choice with, with a lot of the decisions that I made in the setting for singularity trap, unless I wanted to write something completely unrealistic. That's, that's the way that future is. Okay. Yeah. It, it was just, it was interesting to me that, I don't know. It was just one of those things where I felt bad for the main character uh, throughout the book. And and there were lots of great characters in the book, but you kind of follow the one the one main character whose name's escaping me right now. I should have wrote it down. Ivan. Ivan. And um, just from the start, you kind of feel for him. And maybe that's what, you know, a, a good author does. They, they make you connect with the character from the start. And in that case, I, I really connected with him. And then I kind of felt through the whole book that it, oh, this guy... It's kind of sucks what happened to him. Yeah. But again, it's it's the logic of the thing. Why why is Ivan going yeah. asteroid mining for the first time? Well, mm-hmm. it's got to be a desperation move. And that's it. It, it it felt he felt desperate. Yeah. Throughout just all that was like almost the theme. It, it very much so. I that's the word I was looking for. Are you going to do any more books in that universe or is that is that done? No, I think I'll do a sequel. A, a lot of people have expressed a uh, desire for a sequel to that, and I have a, a general storyline for it. Um, you know, I, I'll give it a try at some point. Yeah, I really, I hope you do. I really enjoyed that one. Um, so you'd mentioned Ray Porter earlier. Now, Ray Porter is the, uh, what do you call the narrator, the voice actor? Yeah. Narrator. Now, the the Babaverse books are very colloquial. They're they're full of like kind of turns of phrase and and I, I I guess they're written in such a way that there's a lot of personality in the voice in the way that it's written. Do you have to work with him in advance to convey all that, or does is does he provide the personality for that? He really provides the personality. He, he asked me a couple of questions at the beginning of um, We Are Legion, well, le- at the beginning of each of the books, uh, but mostly to do with how do you visualize this or that character. And I would give him a little bit of input, and then he just took it from there. Um, but the acting is all Ray. Because it, it is absolutely stellar. And mm-hmm. not just the way that you do it, but how many... There, there are just lots, of, and I wish I had a printed version of it in front of me because um, I don't have my Kindle in front of me because I do have them on there. But, you know, like the constant references, you know, because, you know, Bob, that, yeah. you know, that probably reads one way, 
but you've really got to sell that as a, yep. as a voice actor. You have to own that. And he is just so stellar at it. Do you get lots of comments about his performance? Well, if you, if you read most of the audible comments on my books, it's, you know, part my writing, part Ray's delivery. Um, the audible readers are a lot more enthusiastic than the Amazon readers because Ray just injects that much more into it. He really does. I mean, it, it's because I, I do love one of the things I love about audible and Kindle and all that is the, the whisper sync. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times I will drive to lunch, listening, stop, get out of the car, go in, eat lunch, either on my phone or on my Kindle reading where I immediately dropped off on the book then get back in the car and it starts right where I stopped reading. I love that feature. Yeah. So, and now I hear it as him in my head. And so I've adopted his cadence and rhythm in my head uh, as I read it. Yeah. One problem I keep running into though, is every time I'm, whenever I'm listening to one of Peter Klein's books, uh, I'm thinking Bob. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. yeah, and and actually, other people have commented on it too. When they're listening to Ray, and if they lose track for a second of, of which book or which series they're listening to, and, and there's this 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 huge jarring sort of mental lurch as they get back into the proper groove. I you know I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, I could totally see that. So. How did you come up with the idea? I mean, obviously you didn't invent that von Neumann probe concept, but what made you think, all right, this is the interesting thing for me. I'm going to hang my hat on this concept, the self-replicating probe. Well, the original idea uh, of going into space as an ex- in terms of exploration is from A World Out of Time by Larry Niven. Uh but in that one, the pilot is still alive and he doesn't replicate at all. Um, he, he goes off and, and does stuff. And then he comes back to the solar system and has most of his adventure, uh, you know, back here. But I loved the concept so much. And I, I wanted to have a version of the book where somebody just went into space and did spacey things and, and ran with it. And uh, I, I can't remember at what point I went from the idea of having a human pilot to having a cybernetic pilot. Um, it made sense because, you know, you don't want to have things like disease and mortality sure. eat into the story. So uh, if, you're, if your pilot is a uh, computer program version of the original person, then A – you can spend as much time as you want. You don't get tired. You don't get sick. You don't get radiation poisoning. And B, if you're doing von Neumann probes, you can copy yourself. And once you get to that idea, the whole thing just opens right up. Ah, cool. Well, and I think one of the things that attracted me to the concept was, I don't know if you've read Joe Haldeman's The Forever War. Mm Mm-hmm. And so it, it, I loved that concept of, you know, of time dilation and things like that. So I really enjoyed, it's part of what really worked for me. Yeah. Well, when I was writing We Are Legion, I had to make choices about what physical laws I was going to break. Um, I could have given them FTL, but that just seemed to me like it would make a lot of things too easy. I like, for instance, if they if they have FTL, why do they really need to send out probes? Why not just send out human teams to go look and then come back? Sure. So FTL was out. Uh, on the other hand, FTL communications was nice because then they could update each other in real time instead of you know waiting years or decades for for radio messages to to uh, propagate across the universe. Once I had instantaneous communication, then uh, some kind of a VR connection just seemed like the next step. Well, and as we, you know, my, my kids have the Oculus, um, uh, one of Oculus Quest, I guess. Have you seen those? The uh, headgear? Yeah, it's a VR yeah. headgear. 
Yeah. And it's it's pretty astonishing how far it's come kind of in the background. I mean, I, I guess I had no idea that the technology had advanced that far. It's still kind of big and heavy and, you know, whatever. But mm-hmm. um, it, the thing that interested me, and, and I don't know which came first, I think, honestly, your VR concept, I'm sure I read that first, because one of the things that they do in the Quest VR system is they let you have your your computer desktop in it, and you're in a room with a great biz like as big as a big screen in front of you, your computer desktop, and you can sit there and move the mouse and open your desktop and do your computer things, but you now are now immersed in it, and it's as big as a movie theater in front of you. And, oh, yeah. and I'm just sitting there going, "This is where it's going." I, you know, it's 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 not there yet, but it won't be long. Yeah. Well, like with most things uh, technological, uh, it's the evolution of the user interface that really determines when the thing takes off. Um, the early clunky versions of, of computer interfaces, eh, you know, not great. The early clunky versions of telephone interfaces faces, and so forth. Um, again, not great. It's, it's when you start to get the feedback from the consumer and you get the engineers putting out new and better interfaces and suddenly the thing becomes intuitive. And I mean, intuitive on, on a a paper and pencil level, which is something that any kid can grasp right away. Once it gets to that point, that's when the technology just absolutely rockets geometrically. Outstanding. All right. So you live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, or what I refer to as the Pacific Northwest yeah. as an American. Yeah. You live in the Vancouver right. area, right? Yeah. Because um, you'd posted on your, I think, Twitter, a video of you, and it, it made me nauseous, mountain biking uh, with a like a camera on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so you're a skier and you're a mountain biker. And um, on one hand, those are very not technology-oriented, even though I, I know in reality they're both things that are very technical and very technology-oriented. Is that how you escape from the the software world? Yeah. First off, I'm a snowboarder, not a skier. Oh, I'm forgive me. Very, very important distinction. Oh, no, very important we, distinction. We, we make fun of skiers, <laughs> but that's okay. They make fun of us too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Uh, well, first off, I'm I'm an extremely anal, um, uh, procedurally driven person, so. When I go snowboarding or mountain biking, for that matter, I don't just kind of go and, you know, la-di-da, let's point it in that direction and see what happens. I'm a gadget freak. I'm a gear whore. Uh, If you look in that video, right right top dead center of the thing. GPS right in front of you. Garmin 830, yeah. Uh And that's that's tracking my my position and my ride. Uh, I've got the phone in the bike bag. I've got the, obviously, I've got the camera on my chest. Um, you know, I, it's just as bad with snowboarding. I have gadgets. I have different snowboards. I have different sets of bindings and I have a good idea of what each one should be used in what circumstances. Um, you know, you you almost wonder how I'm able to enjoy these things, but (laughs) they really are a lot of fun. Yeah. Living in the, the Midwest, um, outside Chicago, we have flat. So where I am, there's corn all the way to the Mississippi River, and then after that, all the way to Colorado. So yeah, that's. I, so I, I watched that video, and I'm just like, I can't even imagine what it's like to live around that. I just, I have no concept. I was in Seattle for the first time last year, and I just, I just goggled the whole time. I'm just walking around with my eyes as big as saucers because I couldn't imagine what it was like to live there. It was so beautiful. Yeah, I uh, I can't disagree with you on any of it. I I love being where I am. Uh, I love the mountains and the 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 views and the ocean and the trails and the hills. I mean, there are occasional times when I wish things were a little flatter when I'm really tired. But other than that, yeah, it's uh, there's there's trails all over here. um, You know, for non snowboarding season, and we've got three local mountains with an easy driving distance for snowboarding season. And that doesn't count Whistler. Okay. So what's roadkill? You mentioned that earlier. 
Uh, well, that's my next. Oh, I have to be careful here. I'm alternating Roadkill and Earthside. Earthside is the sequel to Outland. Um, but what happened with Outland is I got to about 63,000 words and I hit writer's block. And I actually didn't get a word in for about a week. I finally just decided, you know, I got to do something. So I started writing Roadkill, which I already had the outline for. And uh, now what I'm doing is I'm just switching back and forth. If I start if I start to get bogged down on one of them, I go to the other. And that seems to keep me going. Which one will get edited and published first? At this point, it's a toss-up. But Roadkill is a brand new story. It's not part of any of the series or anything like that. Okay. Well, can you give us a hint, or is it still top secret? Well, the uh, the the uh, elevator pitch is uh, a guy runs over an invisible alien and kills him, and then finds the alien spaceship. Ah, awesome. All right, that's cool. I like that. It's kind of have spaceship will travel. Well, not exactly, but that's what popped into my head. I'm a Heinlein fan. Yeah. So, well, that was a spacesuit. Yeah, that was a spacesuit. Right. So, so what's your favorite book? What do you just go back to? What have you read a dozen times and could read and it's fresh every time? Uh, Wild Side. I don't know uh, that one. Who is that? Stephen. Uh... I don't know, uh, Stephen Gould. Okay. I, I keep, keep wanting to say Stephen J. Gould. It's not the <laughs> the, uh, the scientist. It's Stephen Gould, he's, he's actually another one of my favorite authors, one who I will pick up a book from just about sight unseen. Uh, Wild Side was actually the um, inspiration for Outland to a certain extent. Okay. I, I'm trying to... I, I had wondered if it was, um, God, there was a Heinlein book that I'm trying to think of. Ah, it's killing me. Like not Passenger to the Stars. No, I don't remember what it was. Door into Summer or, um. Door into, is that the one where they, he's going to be like the colony, the kids are supposed to go out and do this test and they end up forming. It's kind of Lord of the Flies. Yeah, I know that's the one I'm thinking of too. And I don't think that's the Door into Summer. No, I don't uh, think that's the Door into Summer. No. And then his sister comes, and his sister was like the space marine, and his sister comes and gets him at the end because yeah. he's done such a good job. And uh, <laughs> That's bugging me now. All right, I'll, I'll append to that. I'll, I'll say that at the end after yeah. I've edited. Well, um, we'll both think of it as soon as we hang up. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough. The new book is great. I really enjoyed it. I, I, it was a marathon listening to it. Um, but I, it's because I just didn't want to stop listening to it. It, it really does work. Um, how can people find you in your work? Um, I have a, uh, I have a blog page, Dennis E. Uh, obviously I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and, you know, audible and Amazon searches will do it. Other than that, it's a uh, random chance, I think. Okay. Well, um, I was just trying to look up that Heinlein book because that's going to bug me now. Of course, I'm not finding it. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, Tunnel I, in the Sky. Tunnel in the Sky. That's it. That's it. Great Jeez. book. I got that 30 seconds early. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and... Yeah. Um, but really, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoy the books. P please keep writing. Oh, I fully intend to. And yes, there will be more Bobaverse books. You've you, you got to be able to tell that I set up several books just in Heaven's River. Well, I there was a couple that I was looking for. All right, I'm going to jump back. Okay. All right, darn it. See, this is what happens. Um, so in Heaven's River... Um, and again, I'm not spoiling anything because I'm I'm I hate spoilers, so I really try to stay away from that. But you, there's definitely factions. I don't think that's a surprise. I think that's in the back cover text um, yeah. that there are now factions in the Bobaverse. And I struggled with that. I didn't. On one hand, I'm like, this is natural, and this is 
this this makes perfect sense to go this way. On the other hand, I kind of hated that there were factions um, mm-hmm. because I liked the optimism of it all. Did you struggle with that, or did you say this is where this needs to go? This only makes sense naturally as a as a logical conclusion. Yeah, it's um, it is inevitable. As soon as I introduced uh, replicative drift, it became inevitable. As the um, as one of the Bob says at one point, uh, of any kind of random walk will gradually take you farther and farther and farther away from from the zero point. Um, and at some point, the Bobs are no longer Bobs. One of them's a Bobby, and okay. that's you know that's some some pretty good drift there. Uh, it was inevitable, but the the um, the story of Starfleet is uh, is a potentially either a short story or a full novel on its own. Yeah. So no, you, you definitely set up, set up a few open doors. So I can't, I, I can't wait to read them. So get started. Yeah. Well, yeah. A couple of people have suggested that I should put out a book of short stories of the Boba verse just to, just to handle some of the smaller ideas. And I may consider that at some point too. Uh, That would be interesting. Yeah, that I I hadn't thought of that. That's a really good idea. I mean, because there's, again, there's so much to do. Just Bridget or uh, the Australian guy whose name is escaping me right now. Um, oh, Henry Roberts. Yeah, Henry Roberts. I I missed not getting any Henry in this in this one because I, I I really enjoyed him. And there's just yeah. there's so many places to go. Yeah, he only came up in third person. Yeah, briefly. He was just referenced briefly. Yeah. Although it was a really cool reference, that's why I was kind of like, oh. So more to come, I hope. Yeah. Well, Dennis, uh, I cannot thank you enough. Um, the new book by Dennis E. Taylor is called Heaven's River. And that makes sense in the context of the book because I know for a long time it had a different title. So it really made me wonder, what's this Heaven's River going to make? Is this going to make sense? And boy, does it. And I really appreciate you coming on. And I can't thank you enough. All right. Thanks for having me. All right.